This meeting is being Hi, Allegra. Oh. Hello. How are hello. you? Hello, hello, hello. So we have two people that we know aren't coming. So hopefully everyone else will show up. Rob is in the house. Hi, Rob. Hey, Rob. Howdy. Hey, Rob. Oh. I think we're just waiting for Grover. Uh, Gaston will not be joining us this evening and Paul will not be joining us this evening. So we need Grover in order to have a quorum. Oh, and here's Grover. And there's Grover. Hi, Grover. Oops. Hello. Hi, Grover. So um, we are going to go ahead and open the meeting. Um, I just want to inform you that Paul will not be able to be joining us this evening, nor Gaston, but we do have a quorum. So we will go ahead. It is 7.02 and we will go ahead and start the meeting. So welcome everyone to the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting of uh, May 9th, 2024. Um, we're first, we're going to approve the April 11th, 2024 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any additions, corrections, omissions. And you have a beautiful cat, Grover. <laughs> All right. So it sounds as if uh, we can go ahead and um, accept the minutes of April 11, 2024. Um, just to note uh, that Greg did revise the minutes of March 14th. Uh, per the conversation we had last time, uh, and he made the edits and um, sent them out to everyone. We had already voted on them with the edits, so we don't need to vote on them. All right, so let me see if Michelle Miller is with us. She is. Um, Greg, can you bring her in or her voice in? <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see you all. Good to see you, too. And thank you so much for joining us. So Michelle was going to be joined by Professor uh, Shabas, but uh, they are tag teaming other meetings. So Michelle is going to be talking to us about the African Heritage Reparation Assembly report and how our work intersects with some of their recommendations. So Michelle, you have the floor. Excellent. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm so appreciative that you've invited us to speak and be here with you and have an opportunity to collaborate and th or think about ways that we can collaborate. And Dr. Shabazz does send his regrets that he couldn't be here. So I wanted to make sure I said that. Um, so, the report, I'm not sure if folks had a chance to take a look at AHRA's final report. Um, if you have, then you saw that one of our three funding priorities is affordable housing. And that came out of a pretty uh, deep consultative process that we went through with the community. So um, we had a survey that over 500 folks uh, responded to. We did large and small listening sessions. And affordable housing was really something that came up again and again. And um, the I think we heard a lot while we were talking to folks that, you know, the work that you're all doing is just phenomenal. And I had a chance to um, look a little bit more uh, more closely at what your initiatives are. And there's also, just like with any of um, these municipal efforts, uh, a sort of a lack of funding or not, in, there's never enough funding. <laughs> Um, and I've seen that you all have done um, great work in trying to trying to find uh, different 
possibilities for um, increasing your funding. And so I, you know, one of the questions that Dr. Shabazz and I talked about asking this group is um, what capabilities do you have to um, to use resources for home ownership opportunities as opposed to um, affordable rental opportunities and if there's any any kind of limitations or um, expectations in that regard. And the reason I ask that and we ask that is because we're hoping that at least um, through the reparations, work will be able to provide home ownership res you know resources that will benefit folks who are pursuing home ownership in the community um, so if there's a way for us to synergize and collaborate around that um, that's one idea that we have and we're also just really open to what thoughts you had after reading the report and and the recommendation that we made I'm going to go ahead and open it up for anyone to respond to that. And I'm sorry, I'm echoing. Uh, okay, so I don't see anyone responding, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, so um, as part of our charge, um, home ownership is part of our charge. Um, affordable housing uh, can be um, you know, providing rental subsidies, it can be uh, development of, um, you know, apartments, it can be the development of affordable home ownership, God bless you, Allegra, uh, and it could be, um, you know, paying down um, uh, costs of mortgages, it can be, you know, working with the Amherst um, Community Land Trust. So, um, I, it really depends on the funds also in terms of CPA around limitations. Um, CPA, we have CPA funds, which is the majority of our funds, right, at this point in time. Uh, and so we can only use our CPA funding uh, within the uh, limitations of, you know, CPA regulations. Um, we are in the process right now of doing uh, a strategic plan or creating priorities um, in terms, and this is why we thought it was really important to have this conversation with you, uh, is that, you know, wanting to hear you know, uh, I've read the report, others have, you know, read the report or have li had links to the report um, a while back. And um, I also was able to see the presentation to town council. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, for us, it was really very important to uh, think about, you know, what is it that, you know, um, the report recommended. And we, in terms of how we're thinking about our uh, priorities, and how to utilize um, our uh, resources that include both funding as well as our advocacy resources uh, and how to work also very closely with other groups that are looking to support a, uh, affordable housing. Um, I'm gonna stop there right now. Um, there was something else I'm gonna say, but um, I'm gonna just leave it right now uh, and see if anybody else has uh, anything to add. Carol? I, I just would say that, I mean, everything, at Erica said, ditto, ditto, sort of, but also there's certainly nothing in what we are asked to do and what our mission is that means that we can't support home ownership. We totally would like to support home ownership and do when we can find ways to do that. Clearly also supporting um, affordable rentals is important, but, but yeah, we look for ways to try to support affordable home ownership and have recently helped one person get into a house through the, the community land trust and have uh, been one of the funders, maybe to be yet more of a funder of the home ownership duplex project over on Ball Lane. Yes, 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 Carol. We, we are very interested in also supporting that project. So I already see a, a possibility where we could collaborate on that. That's a great idea, yeah. Greg, you wanted to? Um, yeah, I was just gonna harp, uh, follow up on the ball lane as well and and kind of present a informal opportunity for collaboration, which is in marketing and outreach and, and communication around those homes. Um, um, there will be an extensive, uh, you know, what we call an affirmative marketing plan, um, you know, to, to seek, um, you know, applicants for a lottery to, to occupy those homes. 
what's different about it is because it's home ownership, there's uh, mortgage qualification steps and so forth. So the, the community outreach and engagement before occupancy is quite extensive, um, you know, to the degree that there is sort of informal networks or communication channels tied um, to uh, the work you've been doing, Michelle, uh, you know, with the reparations group, um, sort of when those communications um, from that developer come out, um, it can be really valuable, I think, and and support what you're doing um, to to you know to retweet, you know, send to any list you have, et cetera, uh, those um, those invitations to apply um, because I think you know the the program that those homes are getting built with is expressly aimed at um, sort of rebalancing the home ownership uh, equation um, to accommodate you know communities that have been marginalized in the past. So uh, that's right up the alley but it's on all of us to make sure we spread the word widely um and, and make sure you know those who can most benefit uh hear about it and are able to throw their hats in the ring absolutely what, greg yes one other <laughs> thing that pops into my head is that uh especially with home ownership it isn't it's start now don't wait until it's time to apply because there are programs in place to help people do the things they need to do to get their um, their finances in order for a while before the application process in order to be ready to be able to qualify for the mortgage. I think there's some of those programs that may be just starting now. I know that Valley is planning to at, announce those things like a year or something before application. So it's not too soon. It, to to work right. on finding people to um, get involved in those prog those programs. Yeah, we actually had uh, Jessica Allen, uh, I think, at our last meeting, and they have an outreach coordinator who's already starting to do the work. Um, and uh, there were a couple of groups we had mentioned, and uh, they really, really want to have contacts. So what Carol and Greg is saying is really very important is that we know that um, that it takes time to get your finances in order, your papers in order. Uh, and so they want to start preparing right now. They want to start getting um, information out there, seeing if they can get people into these types of, you know, um, sessions that can help them prepare. Um, 2028 seems like it's, you know, far away. It's around the corner when it comes to finances. And if That's you don't true. have closing, yes. And if you don't have, you know, the ability to do closing costs or, you know, even the time or the paperwork, et cetera. So they, they are, they're gearing up right now. So I don't know if you have connection to Jessica Allen, but if not, I can, you know, um, connect you to, um, because she was asking for organizations that she can contact in terms of the BIPOC community. Um, and so they really, really want to start the work now. Yeah, I had I had a chance to talk to her a couple times about that. Oh, um, the last time I spoke with her, though, was on site over there probably close to a year ago. So I, I, I will absolutely reach out to her. I think that um, okay. that's an an, an excellent, um, you know, strategy for for us, uh, the AHRA and the affordable housing to come together and um, provide any kind of opportunities that like I, I can imagine us, you know, hosting, um, you know, an informational session, uh, you know, sponsored sort of by both of our groups. Um, but I will definitely speak with with them and and see where they're at with all of that. And and if if you, um, Eric, if you want to start an email that we could kind of both be on the same thread, or I'd also be happy to do that if it's easier for you. Um, I can do and it. we can. Okay, that would be amazing. And then we can get that conversation going um, because I think Carol's absolutely right that uh, it's going, you know, it, it was clear from Jessica that it was going to take time for folks to do the necessary requirements to be approved for this um, for this opportunity. Absolutely. I uh, After her last presentation, I sent her some context that I had in terms of the Native American community here in Western Mass. So I will definitely um, do an email this evening after our meeting. Um, and Allegra wants to jump in. Um, I was just thinking, and I can't find her email right now, but I was thinking it might be helpful to 
just have the possibility for community outreach at community-based events. Like for example, there's the old versus young basketball tournament coming up and that's at Mill River, which is also in the neighborhood of where the development will be. Brilliant. Um, I think yep. there's also the, um, the, the powwow is coming up at the high school. So those could be um, like natural places where the community gathers that it might be helpful to have a um a table as well as i think the town is having the aapi um heritage month celebration and there's going to be a, an event around juneteenth i'm not sure if it will actually be on juneteenth um but then the black business association of amherst is also holding a cookout at mill river on the 19th of june from like awesome. two to six so those are all good places to plug in um and i was also just thinking um perhaps if the timing so aligns and the new barry roberts building is built by the time the valley homes can be built and some of that money is available perhaps we could earmark some of that as down payment assistance um since it looks like arpa might be not on the table at that point um so that could be a concrete way where we could provide some funding for the families to get in to the units i think those are all excellent ideas and probably jessica is not aware of all of those upcoming events where we could really have a campaign. I mean, when you just named them all, I'm thinking that's that's a whole campaign right there. So I would be happy to support that in any way. Um, and, and just sort of Allegra along the lines of uh, what you said about down payment assistance. One of the kind of priorities, I think, from our perspective as a committee is, uh, well, so just so you know where where things stand, we've been waiting for a legal opinion to come back from the town's attorney for many months. Um, and I recognize that it's the first legal opinion in the state of Massachusetts regarding reparations, local reparations. So it's taking some time. They're being thoughtful about it, um, but it's expected back in the next couple weeks is my understanding. And once we have that, the idea is then that a, some kind of successor body would be um, put together to begin, um, you know, working on the recommendations. But I, you know, just in kind of being out there and seeing what other, like what Evanston and, and their process and their journey, it's so important for us to get that first benefit out um, so that the community one can uh, have faith that this is not just another, you know, a, a symbolic gesture and that there is money that is available for benefits to be made. So I can't think of a better project really um, within the context of what we got from our consultative process that's upcoming than this ball lane um, and our funds are probably a little bit different than yours. Our funds require a two-third vote of the town council to be approved. So we need initiatives that come before the council that um, will speak to the council and, and what they're working on. So I just wanted to kind of let you all know where things stand from, from you know, where we're at and um, and so that we do have some limitations, but hopefully uh, we'll we'll get the ball rolling here soon once that legal opinion comes back. I think that'll be very, very important. Um, Grover, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, Michelle, can you clarify quickly what the legal opinion is waiting for? Is it about the formation of, of an ongoing body or is it about recipients? of reparations who can be, they can be in those kinds of terms that's a great question it's i think it's going to respond to the um the report um in all of the aspects of the report we did um have some very specific questions but the initial legal opinion that we got uh 
goodness, this is a couple years ago now, and it is in, in the appendix of the report. So you could take a look at that. That really addressed the anti-aid amendment and um, the public purpose rule in the state of Massachusetts, which says that you can't direct municipal funds toward a particular racial group or toward a particular groups. Um, and so there were some ways that we could deal with that. One of the ways was to, um, for Amherst to um, essentially put a resolution forward or put something forward that says that uh, the town of Amherst believes that reparations are a public purpose. And then it would go through a process, um, the state, the legislature process to get um, a, like a, a special um, oh my goodness, the name is like it's it's out of my head for this moment. But basically, um, we get a, like a home rule um, that would say that in Amherst we say that reparations is a public purpose, and therefore municipal funds can be used toward, um, you know, d toward these initiatives. Other ways to do it are to funnel the money through nonprofit organizations that are already in existence um, that would have similar goals. So I think what's going to come back is really to say, how can we direct these benefits legally um, and uh, what what are our what are our options? Um, and it will be interesting because in Evanston, for example, they're also our home rule state, and um, they're they're directing cash ben cash benefits. They're directing individual cash benefits to people, and um, so you know whether they're going to get. Uh, legal pushback on that is yet to be seen, but we're sort of watching and waiting how it, it's going to work out. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was actually, uh, was sort of my uh, incoherent comment that I was going to make that I sort of decided not to, because I know we've raised um, this here as part of a trust conversation too, in terms of priority populations and um, how we can um, direct our funds to priority populations. We're told because of the housing, the Fair Housing Act, that there might be challenges to that. So I think this would be very helpful to um, have uh, a legal ruling to see how you know this plays out. Um, I think if I'm correct that uh, the funding we may get uh, via lieu and payment of affordable uh, apartments that may not have those restrictions, but we may have to figure that out as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think all housing, all housing has race blind restrictions, right? So then it's the complicated formula like Valley is doing to determine. That's my understanding. Of fair housing. Yeah, I. It's not going to be simple. <laughs> it's like so many different things trying to make sure that everything is fair and they don't and they conflict with each other many times and so yeah uh but anyway we're working on doing what we can do also absolutely are you all still going to get be benefited by the um, transfer, the transfer fee that uh, two of our counselors put forward previously, if that gets approved by the state? We will. Yeah, we will be. If there's, a, there's one that is a generic one that people in the state, low income housing people and a whole coalition of people are trying to put through. If oh. that one passes then we would be able to do a transfer fee that would just go to us. That's wow. the way the state one goes. The difficulty with it is that the threshold for the transfer fee is such a high, uh, right now, it requires houses to be sold for so much money that there aren't hardly any like that here because it was made up in Eastern Mass. But they're trying to get yeah. that amended. And so if that gets amended and goes through, which we hope, then uh, we would get all of the transfer fees. The one that our two, uh, our two council people put forward shares that money between the, the, town, the town's something or other fund 
and the council and I mean and the and the trust. That's the, right. That's right. The capital improvement fund. Yeah. That's right. yes. You're yes. right. <laughs> right. And so either of them will either of them will give us something. Either of them would be a, a great would be a great boon to to the trust and to the town. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know that Dr. Shabazz would like to be in conversation um, with this group, especially once the successor body is put together um, and even before then. But um, I think I'm, you know, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. I think a first step right now, though, connecting with Jessica for the ball lane and the informal um, promotional uh, collaboration is just a, a wonderful way to start. Um, and, and I would, I would really love to, to work with you all on that. For that sure. And I, and I know she, she loves Thank assistance. Her. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't rub. Yeah. I was just, yeah. I'm just going to affirm and just say that um, Erica, if you want to see, see me on that, I can help move, move that yep. along. And Absolutely. Um, both you and Carol, I'll see, see. Um, Yeah, because I know um, that was raised um, in terms of all those different events. Allegra, you had raised that while Jessica was here. And I think Greg, you had, or Nate had mentioned about the calendar on the website. But I think the more we can get directly to her, I actually sent her a, a link to the powwow in May. Uh, at, is it, yeah, at the end of May. It's at the end of May. Um, so um, the more we can get direct links, the the better. Some. And we have a pretty extensive, we have a mailing list of over 500 residents in Amherst that we will use, um, you know, as, as, as we can to get, to get the word out. So um, thank you for suggesting that as well, Greg. Perfect. I think that's great. Um, and maybe, um, as Carol said, um, Valley CDC actually has amazing workshops, uh, even post buying a home, what you should consider, um, which uh, I actually took their pre buying a home workshop, which, you know, for a first time homeowner was just absolutely, you know, just informative, but they have so many different ones. Um, I can send them to you as well. Or if you want, um, Carol keeps a list uh, of all of the uh, uh, people who are interested uh, in terms of our meetings. And then we also share a lot of um, those types of workshops that come across you know, our emails. So if you want to be put on that mailing list, we can do that. I would love that. That'd be great. Yes, please. Um, can, if you, do you have my email, Michelle, somewhere? I or do. Is, we'll of course. E email <laughs> me whatever emails you would like to have on that list and I'll make sure they get there. <laughs> That's great. I will definitely do that. Thank you, Carol. Sure. Thank you. All right, so action is I'm going to do an email after we meet this evening. Uh, that's going to include um, you, Michelle, and uh, to Jessica Allen, uh, getting us all on the same page. I will copy you, Greg and Carol, um, and we will try to get as many contacts for them for their outreach staff. Um, she was pretty excited. Um, she talked a little bit about the background of the outreach staff and um, some of the work that they are starting to get um, going. So we'll start with that and then we can have a further conversation about doing collaborative um, information sessions with Jessica uh, and Valley CDC as well. Um, so and then you'll you'll get in touch with us about, um, you know, an update on the legal um, ruling as well as possibly maybe another conversation with you and Dr. Shabazz. Absolutely. As soon as we have that, um, well, as soon as I have that, I will send it all to you. And yeah, I think that would be a great time for us to get back together and have a conversation about it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I was just, I'm sorry it took this long for us to get together, but um, really appreciate all the work you're doing and looking forward to working together. We are so much looking forward to working as well with you uh, and with the whatever group comes um, out of uh, the next rendition of a wonderful assembly that put together a really comprehensive um, and very in-depth report um, that gave a lot of history that, 
you know, for any of us who are new to Amherst, which I'm not, but it was just really amazing. I actually shared it with colleagues and friends, um, especially people at UMass um, who need to also have this history. So thank you so very much for all thank the work. Thank you, Erica. Done and you're doing. Oh. oh, well, thank you and have a great rest of the evening and meeting and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Thank have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Night. Okay, so uh, we are now going to, uh, well, let me just say, are there any comments or any follow-up? Just want to give a few minutes if there's anything else that we should note. Okay, all right, so we're going to move. Um, sorry for the change in the agenda, but um, uh, Michelle had contacted us and wanted to um, have informed us that Dr. Shabazz couldn't make it because they're both going to uh, coordinated meetings and so they're tag teaming who's going where and so she wanted to be on ASAP. Um, so uh, again, if you haven't read the report, um, it's uh, the link is on the um, Amherst uh, website and um, they also have a presentation that they did to the town council. Uh, I believe the presentation is also on the website. Um, so I, I would really take a look at that because it is very, very informative about um, the history, past and present of Amherst and um, equity, uh, especially in terms of racial equity. OK, so we're now going to move to the VFW project. We're going to start first with Father Bill's um, in Main Spring site visit. That was very exciting. I'm going to ask Greg to go ahead and start. Um, uh, maybe we can talk about who went and uh, Greg actually put together a really informative document afterwards, just a summary. So that's why I want him to go first because he probably has most of the uh, insight. Uh, and then um, I'll just follow with some of the things that I really thought was poignant um, that links uh, to the VFW project. So go ahead, Greg. Sure. Um, so I guess this was two weeks ago now, I think. Uh, uh, Delegation of folks from Amherst, um, uh, organized by Dave uh, Zomack, uh, including myself and Erica uh, and uh, Nate, uh, who's joined us as well tonight. Um, and then uh, some other staff members, uh, Building Commissioner Rob Mora, uh, Dave, um, uh, and I'm probably forgetting one person on the staff side. Uh, and then uh, also um, some team members from Craig's Doors, which is, as most of you know, our, our local shelter provider in Amherst. Um, and then a UMass architecture student, actually, uh, who's been doing some cool work. Her, uh, some of her work is in your packet, actually. So we all went out um, and um, got more of a walk around and and uh, and an information session than we really expected. Um, but we went to go visit Father Bill's and Mainspring, uh, their um, housing resource center, which is a new model that. Um, that they're rolling out and is now being replicated around the state. Um, but that is a combination of a shelter um, as well as some permanent supportive housing and then a lot of daytime services all in one location. Um, and that's brand new. They opened in the fall. Um, so we got um, kind of a walk around, sort of uh, learned about both some of the services that happen there, uh, you know, from, you know, kind of some of the specifics around how they offer shelter. Uh, and then uh, and how that connects to their permanent housing strategies as an organization. Um, they're a longstanding group that's been building up momentum for many decades in Eastern Mass. Um, so this is kind of the culmination of a much more modest beginning of the organization and took a long time to build to here. Uh, but I'd say um, some things that stand out were that the shelter plus housing model was really interesting. Um, they raised a great deal of private money um, to support, especially their shelter facility. Uh, that will look a little bit different here, uh, you know, when we try and pull something off. Um, but maybe some some nuggets of wisdom in there for us. Um, and then also just, uh, you know, a really amazing space, I thought, um, you know, and, and, you know, both, you know, functional um, and client centered uh, and, um, you know, and, you know, a really sort of inspiring jumping off place um, for, you know, what we're going to try and pull off, um, you know, a local version of. Um, and, and I guess the other thing I'll note, too, was, that I was personally very excited about is that uh, we had everybody who came from Craig's Doors, um, uh, including uh, Tim McCarthy, who has joined you know, this meeting several times, um, you know, were uh, you know, really enthusiastic um, and asking fantastic questions and planning lots of follow ups with uh, the, the service provision team at, at Father Bill's um, and really just uh, kind of soaking it up uh, a lot, which I think is really promising. For where we're going because we're going to need um, um, you know folks on the ground to um, kind of be getting information from all directions and including folks who've done it before um, 
so yeah, so there's a lot, you know, we, we could delve into the weeds um, and, um, and maybe we'll do that a little bit when we get to, you know, a, a quick update about where, where we're going here in town, but maybe I'll stop there and, and ask Erica if you want me to delve into anything else specifically or if you want to add anything. Um, so one of the things I just want to say is that it is absolutely comprehensive from literally doing outreach for individuals who are still out in the community that um, are either unable to come in, um, in, in coming in in terms of their shelter. Uh, they don't turn anybody away, which was, I thought was absolutely amazing. Um, and so they do outreach. Um, they bring people in into the shelter. Uh, the shelter, I believe, is over capacity, but we got a tour of it. It was absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, uh, Greg just used client-centered. Uh, I would also include trauma-informed. And I know Isabella used that in terms of her uh, presentation, what she put together. But the, 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 the team that met with us, they spent so much time with us and it was absolutely clear how focused they were on ensuring one safety, but it was both physical as well as mental, as well as sort of a spiritual safety for individuals, as well as a whole community there. Uh, and that they were really focused on as much as they could to really get people into a safe space. So if it was just connecting them um, out in the community until they were able to come into the shelter, keeping them in the shelter uh, during the day, um, they couldn't stay in the dorms, but they could stay in, they have lots of programming to keep them there, feeding them, uh, providing healthcare. So that was another piece that they actually brought in a primary care center, a satellite, into the facility, which was amazing. Uh, they have mobile closets. They, you know, they have all kinds of things. It's just so comprehensive and thinking about the needs of the individuals and trying to meet them where they're at. So it's, um, you know, it, people do not have to be substance use free, but they have to be able to take care of themselves and they have to be safe. And then trying to get them from shelter to permanent housing. That was just really amazing um, how comprehensive it is. Um, I think it was a really high bar for all of us. Um, the other piece, they not only did they spend all this time with us, um, they also uh, uh, are giving us time as we think about the VFW project. Um, they are absolutely available to us in Craig's door. Um, Craig's door, of course, you know, immediately got everybody's, you know, information because they want to continue that that relationship and conversation. Um, but for us too, it's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, example of how comprehensive and deeply involved and engaged they are in terms of client-centered, trauma-informed care and really meeting um, individuals at where they're at and really respecting those individuals. Um, it was just really amazing. They had to raise $26 million um, uh, and uh, 10 of that was fundraising. The other uh, 16 they were able to get, I assume from, from the state. But it's a really high bar. Um, and, you know, my, my feeling is, is that um, that's just the beginning because, you know, creating the physical facility is just the beginning. Um, the ability to maintain it and sustain it uh, is really also um, the conversation we had with them about, you know, how do you maintain your funding? You know, how do you, you know, get your food? Um, you know, it, it's just really amazing uh, what they can teach us in, in um, thinking about uh, the VFW project. Of course, the VFW project is not going to be at that size. It's not, the land is not even that available. And so some of the conversations we already had along the way was, how do we maybe work with other organizations to provide services, not necessarily at the site, but um, at, you know, maybe at the community health center or in other uh, sites, but to be able to um, also have such comprehensive uh, services uh, and thinking about you know, how do we do that at this particular site that may not have as much space uh, available to it. So I think Nate, you might want to jump in too, just in terms of your experience. Um, so I was able to drive in the car with Nate, which was really wonderful. And, and Greg was not kind enough to pick me up from my house. So I got to spend a little time with both of them, which was really wonderful. Yeah. Hi everyone. I think, yeah, I mean, what's been covered, um, you know, Father Bill's is a, you know, their organizational chart, you know, is like 50 people deep. Uh, they had been around for a long time. I think that uh, for Amherst, I think the important thing is, you know, what will work in our site. So we have um, someone that will, is working with us to get ideas. Greg sent stuff through in the packet. 
And I think, you know, what, what they found was that their administrative space was already too small when they started in terms of providing services. And so the site in Amherst, you know, isn't, you know, it's big, but not that big. And so I think what's important is, you know, what, what's the right size for uh, beds, for shelter, for what kind of housing do we want? What kind of day services? Do we have a space, as Greg mentioned at one meeting, that could be um, shared space there for different providers to come to the site? Do we make use of the bank center? I think there's a lot to consider. Uh, I think operations is really important, as Erica mentioned. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, you know, you know, they were doing a great job, and it, it's amazing to see what they what they have. But when you hear about how much work it it took, and you know, it, it you know how much planning went in on fundraising and then operations, what they do for services, it's it's really comprehensive. I think it's a really great thing for us to strive for. Um, but I think you know, we're I'm not, I'm not sure what we have in terms of, you know, what the town, what we, what the steps now for the town is, okay, um, we'll come up with a concept idea for the site programming ideas. And then at some point the town and the trust and others will really develop a request for a proposal to seek, it could be a developer, it could be someone to then take over this project. And so, you know, currently we're in the phase of, well, what's the right size? What are the services? And then we kind of have to consider how involved is the town or what kind of parameters do we have in this request for proposal? And so, um, you know, I think our eyes are open now and, you know, we're, there's other uh, models and things to consider, but funding's big. There's not a ton of funding for shelter construction. So some of it is, you know, what, you know, what can we do there uh, for housing? What does the housing look like? Like I said, you know, is it, um, you know, if it's not that many units, is it, you know, eligible for tax credits and how do we fund something like that? And so, there's all these pieces. And so uh, we're hoping that we can work through some of this in the next few months and then get some ideas and, and, and just keep it moving. Um, yeah. And may, maybe I can just foreshadow a little bit, Eric, if that's okay. If I could just go ahead and talk about what's happening in Amherst going forward at this point. Um, so uh, I think we announced, uh, I can't remember if we named them or not um, uh, uh, at our last meeting, but we are now contracted with Narrowgate, uh, which is the architecture firm that, um, that d designs uh, a lot of affordable housing um, and community serving uh, development. Uh, they also uh, were the architects that designed uh, the Father Bill's location that we visited. Um, so we're contracted with them uh, for a short term contract to do some um, some initial visioning, visioning and some design concepts, you know, to um, to, to receive some initial public input. Um, to inform an eventual RFP. So what uh, th there's going to be a few different pieces of that, um, uh, both um, sort of with public stakeholders and then with some more focused folks. So we're uh, trying to, unfortunately, we weren't able to nail it down before our meeting tonight, um, but there's going to be a, a public stakeholder meeting um, in early June. So um, either the first or the second week of June, we'll have something uh, which, um, you know, which, uh, you know, we'll welcome um, lots of different input, lots of different voices to offer input into this. Um, we're going to frame that, uh, and this is important, and we uh, hope we can get support from all of you in this. Um, you know, that will be framed not as, you know, not not should, but how, really, right? We've, as a town, decided that we should do this. And so this conversation is about how is the best way to do this. Um, so that's what that input juncture will be. Um, we're trying to organize something, and, and I again, we're early still in the engagement, so um, the the edges are, are rough still. But my hope is, and I've been in touch with Tim about this, to organize something a little narrower and smaller, uh, focused exclusively on folks um, who have utilized shelter services in Amherst before, um, or perhaps are right now, um, to get their input into this process. Um, so uh, we have um, some initial plans to uh, to make sure we center. Um, you know, their opinions and their needs and their experiences uh, in, in how we inform this. And then we're also going to make sure the flip side of this is also making sure that we, um, you know, that the ideas and the initial sort of uh, concepts, you know, we want to stretch ourselves at the same time. We don't want to come up with something so um, uh, fantastic that it can't be funded. Right. So the goal is also to make sure we get input from the folks um, who know how to go deep in financing this kind of thing. Um, so with that in mind, we're probably going to do a stakeholder session um, with folks from the development side who can kind of inform the, you know, questions like what Nate raised about tax credits. How many units would it need to get tax credits? 
Um, you know, what are the, you know, the square footage splits that we should think about between um, shelter and permanent supportive housing as a uh, as, as a funding obligation, questions like that, um, our partners in the development community are going to be able to offer some input into that. So that's going to be a really vital feedback that we need to gather up front. So an eventual RFP is, um, you know, is not such a, you know, uh, a, a threaded needle that it's impossible for anybody to respond to. Um, and I think one of the things that the uh, we, we hope are, are the product we get from Narrowgate will be will you know, be questions that probably remain unanswered that the town will have to address, priorities that we'll have to um, uh, decide on as a town, you know, you know, what's more important, this or that, is it, is it vital to have services? Okay, is it vital enough that we should subtract four units? Perhaps the floor space might demand that, you know, so I think hopefully they're going to set us up with some of those questions rather than just, um, you know, offer some some floor plans, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, or some, you know, some, some visualizations. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the public side of that, uh, look out for information about an early June um, public engagement effort. Um, and um, uh, my hope is to get um, lots of different voices, but uh, enthusiastic, supportive voices. And I would hope that uh, we can count all of you uh, in that regard. So look out for a date, uh, hopefully within Hopefully by the end of tomorrow, but if not, probably Monday we'll have a date uh, on when that's going to happen. Any questions, comments? The the only other thing that I want to say is, uh, which I think we all will advocate for. One of the things that I heard from the staff over and over again was make sure when things start getting designed that you have people who use the space looking at how the spaces are formed um, both you know the the clients who are going to be in their ad client advocates as well as those who are actually maybe staff there um, because uh, as greg mentioned the administrative area got um, very small very quickly they had other areas where it was so tight um, and they just sort of grew right out of, or it just didn't work or um, it actually wasn't safe. So um, they really learned from that and they're doing a Brockton site uh, and they are literally having staff, kitchen staff look at the kitchen, you know, administrative staff look at administrative space, et cetera. So um, that is something that we have to keep on advocating for to make sure that happens. So we actually have a, uh, a workable space for those who are going to be uh, using that space. It was it was really a wonderful experience, and um, I can actually see once we get further on, possibly doing another site visit to them uh, or having them come here. They were just absolutely phenomenal and generous, absolutely generous in their time uh, in helping us think through um, how to do this. So um, maybe another trip to come. Yeah. And might be helpful just to end with noting too that there's also, uh, you know, I don't know if they're the very first to do this, perhaps they are in mass, but they're certainly not the last. There's other um, smaller communities that are also pursuing um, and further along in building similar, you know, more modest size facilities. You know, I think um, I'm aware of one that I think is um, about to kick off construction in Springfield. Um, there's another one in uh, Greenfield, one in Attleboro, and I'm sure a few more as well. So possible we take a visit to one of those as well, uh, you know, as things progress. Great point. Very great point. All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, and uh, Dave's not here, but thanks uh, to Dave. Uh, it was really a wonderful experience. And I know Craig Storer also really enjoyed the collaborative uh, partnership of going together and thinking through this and uh, is really looking forward to continuing that work. Carol, did you have anything you wanted to say? I'm sorry I didn't get to go. That's my only thing to say. I had out of town guests and all kinds of things going on, so I didn't get to go, but I'm glad that you all went. It was amazing. It was pretty amazing. Okay, um, so as you see that we've had a little bit of change in the agenda, um, I see that Laura Baker has joined us and, and welcome Grace as well. Um, so we did have Michelle um, already talk about the African Heritage Reparation Assembly and now we've talked about the VHW um, update and uh, Father Bill's site visit. So we still have time. So we're gonna actually go ahead and talk about the bond bill 
Um, that was an item under other topics in June's meeting, uh, but we thought it was really important since especially we have a little bit of time before Shelly joins us and we talk about the strategic plan um, to think about, um, we actually had an invitation for, from Representative Dom asking us um, to let her know what we think are priorities uh, with regard to the bond bill. And um, Greg sent um, uh, a flyer with regard to some of the priorities from Western um, Mass Coalition. Uh, and so we thought, um, you know, uh, Carol and I can write a letter and the Royal We is usually Carol who writes it and I um, review it um, and just uh, putting out what we think are priorities that we think our representatives should push forward. Um, and again, I just want to thank our representative Dom for being so much at the forefront of uh, pushing for affordable housing and seeing it as a social determinant of health uh, that is so critical. Um, so I just want to open it up to see if there's anything that you saw on that list um, that you think should be priorities that we push forward. I know I have two areas, but I just figured I'd go ahead and open it up to you guys first. Well, um, I guess I, my understanding was that we were going to ask at least the one thing that we were definitely going to ask was that a priority be um, the, the, the tax. The transfer fee, thank you. Yes. <laughs> the transfer fee. So we, I think we know we want to do that. Is there anyone who doesn't think that that's the case? I, I not have to spend a lot of time on that one because I think we already agreed about it. So unless I hear something that says that's a bad idea suddenly, what is, that's definitely what's going to, that will definitely be in the letter. And if we can come to agreement and without taking too much time about it, about something else that is in that list, then uh, we could do that. So. Can I just ask a clarifying question about the tax or um, just if there is any information on what that might look like, um, if it's not the million, whatever is, is listed as. What the lower amount is? Yes, thank you. That is. Um, Oh, I saw it. I think it's formulated in some way that it's like changes with the town. So it's something like the top X percent of I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was something that let it float yeah. so that in a town that had really a lot of high things, it would be higher than in a town that didn't. But I can't remember the language, Allegra. I'll see if I can find it somewhere. I mean, I, I would definitely agree to language more like that than to a set amount that doesn't necessarily reflect what our real estate market looks like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was some way that had it to be able to float, but I, I can't remember it. Thank you. I'll try for to find point. it again. <laughs> Greg, did you want to say something? Yeah, at one point, and, and so... Um, Right now, it just it just says a million dollars, you know, per the basically the Healy bill uh, that um, that they started with um, the Western Mass Coalition. At first, I think the original recommendation for adjustment they named, I think seven hundred and fifty thousand um, at, and and then it tied to like a float mechanism, like Carol described. The most recent recommendation that's in the packet, that's the most recent Rex from the Western Mass Coalition. Um, just says, make it more relevant to us, basically, and kind of puts it to the legislature to say, to you know, if, yeah, and, and I, which I think is probably wise. Um, replace it with a mechanism that will make the transfer via, fee available to all communities, amend reasonable affordable housing emission fund language to allow rural communities to create such funds via intermunicipal agreements. Um, so they're just saying, make it more accessible to a broader set of the state. Um, then naming a specific way how that should happen, um, which I think probably is a re reflection of the best political estimation of what might be possible rather than prescribing a certain thing for the legislature to do. They haven't changed much in the bill um, since it's traveled through committees. I'm not aware of if, if anything got tweaked after it went through the bonding committee. I don't think it did, but... Um, I'm looking. I don't see anybody else. So the other one that I thought, again, we don't have to spend a lot of time, but I do think it's important to support the language around public housing. It would seem to me that we have public housing across the state 
that is empty that needs to be filled and anything we can get to get the public housing renovated and done um you know it just is so important that you know that public housing um, or housing authorities um, have the resources to ensure that people who are eligible can get the get into housing. It just seems crazy that we have places that are open because they can't renovate them fast enough. Um, and so that was just my thought was to possibly support that as well. I'd support that. Thank you, Grover. Anybody else? Any or thank you, Allegra. All right. So those were the. Right. So, I, so I would be inclined to write it saying we we hope that you will support all of these initiatives, but in particular, please support these two, this one and this one. Um, that sound good to folks. Okay. Good. Perfect. And so I think that we can now. I see that Shelly is here. So um, what Shelly has offered to do, and which we are very grateful for, when Greg will bring, bring her in the room at any minute now, you've seen the draft of the goals at the small group consisting of, from us, of Erica and Rob and I, and um, Shelly and um, Nate and Greg have been there. So we have some draft goals, and I believe our hope for tonight is that we can agree on what the, those goals are and then we will continue to work on what the strategies beneath the goals will be but Shelly is going to facilitate this part for us we have until about we have until maybe I don't know till 10 or till quarter of what time is it it's just eight so till a little after quarter of nine because we've got a couple other things to do Shelly's going to facilitate this so Erica and I can just be participants. So Shelly, welcome and it's all yours. Hi everyone, nice to be here with you. So do, do folks have the goals in front of you from your packet? Yep, great. So um, these are a few, three goals that the, the smaller subcommittee came up with and it was taking into account the conversation that we had back in, I think it was February. And then some additional comments were submitted by Grover. And so it was thinking through um, the different conversations and then coming up with three goals at this point that we wanted to go through and get some feedback from you on the possible strategies underneath them. We are not proposing those strategies tonight. That is, that's not on the table. The only point of having those possible strategies is just to add some clarity to what the goal, the intent of the goal and what kinds of things would fall under these three goals to keep them separate, but we're not gonna be discussing those strategies tonight. So it's just looking at the, the, the overall goals. So I'm just gonna start with the first one and read it and then ask for your feedback. And then if the others on the subcommittee want to talk about the numbers that we derived at, uh, that we're presenting, then please chime in on that. I'll do a little bit of that, but but you'll give better clarity. So the first is one focused on, I guess I could say that we've also chatted about a possible proposed niche for the trust to, to consider a, a, as you define your role in the community is to possibly really looking at your role as increasing the supply of affordable housing in Amherst. Uh, so I'll just say that overall, and that, that's just proposed. That's not something that we're actually going to get into so much tonight, but just to put that on the table. So the first goal is a, a development goal, and that it just says to support the creation of 250 homes affordable to people earning below 100% of the area at median income over the next five years. So we did have some discussion around the number, how many units, and um, diff some kind of differing opinions, but feeling that 250, given the size of your community, given what's kind of um, what you see happening at this point, that that felt like um, a, a bit of a stretch, but not too much, that it felt like a, a doable number. Um, and then 100% of the area median income is... I think that that's how your trust defines moderate income, it, it, right? Is that correct? That it's up to 100%. So that's, and then 
five years was just a number that we we chose that could be modified. But what are folks' um, reactions at this point to this goal? Well, I'll jump in and say that, um, you know, it could be something like 80 units in two years and have it be a little bit more immediate. Uh, you know, the housing production plan, the town's comprehensive housing policy all said like 250 over five years. And I feel like, um, I don't know, five years maybe seems like a long time for people and then it doesn't, you know, it just, just kind of sits there. And so I know 80 and two might be hard, but you know, it's like maybe get a little pressure there and keep things moving, um, you know, at least get a project started. That's that could happen. I, I just think that the five year horizon is something that might seem a little distant. Do you think that strategies could get to that a little bit more um, to put more specific to be more specific and to perhaps dig into a couple more immediate possibilities? Yeah, maybe that's the way to go about it. I just think that I think I guess my problem is with 250 is that it's been around a number of reports and it I would rather mm -hmm. just put a different number. Mm -hmm. Okay. 225, <laughs> 280. I don't know, something. It's just it seems like, oh, here's 250 again. It's like, well, why is it? It's a half of one percent of what you know the housing, <laughs> you know, the state says in the, you know, in the regulations, but let's come up with something that, you know, might be either more feasible or something. So, you know. Yep. Other thoughts on that number? Reactions? Um, yeah, that, that's that's an interesting perspective that I hadn't occurred to me, but I, I do appreciate that. Mm. I'm I'm less comfortable with eighty in two years because I feel like that sets up for failure. Because if you if you if you know twelve months go by and you're at zero, then it's eighty in one year, and it just seems too <laughs> too. Too big a hill to climb. You know, some larger number over a greater period of time seems like it's something to work towards. I think. Grover. Yeah, to Rob's point, it makes me curious about what our criteria is in terms of like eighty in the pipeline in two years or eighty keys in hand. Are really different metrics and I'm not saying they need to be defined in the goal but mm -hmm. that's the kind of when when we're writing the actual plan it might be helpful to just have many footnotes or something that's defining these terms but that also would help clarify the setting of the goals right so mm -hmm. because it even made me wonder I think our last plan we outgrew it by the years like I think the cutoff time was 2022 or 2023 so it's like are the North Amherst tomes we were just talking about, would that count within this plan or is it outside of the plan, right? Those kinds of questions would mm -hmm. shift my opinion because that's, you know, almost 30, 30 units there, right? Like, so, and then also it makes me curious about, so what this is new development, but for example, if um, the public, ha you know, like, if the public housing bill passes and then a bunch of unused units come online, would that count? I think it might, it, would it count for the town if there was a rehab, right? Like, so just curious how we're counting. Yeah, if we're gonna make the goals be measurable, we better know what we're measuring exactly or we will get lost. Good points. <laughs> I'm wondering if that can't be under some of the strategies. Um, I mean, uh, I, I I would feel 80 in two years is a lot, just having been on the trust since 2019. Um, we do have things in the pipeline, and pipelines take a long time. Ball Lane, mm -hmm. 2020, mm -hmm. what is it, 2028? Uh, and then uh, Beltertown Road is also... Um, <sighs> I mean, I, I think five years is a good number with what we have in the pipeline to actually open door and have people inside. Um, 
but I, I think if, if we make it too narrow, I, I think it's a little um, disheartening at times to look at our goals and say, oh, well, it's coming, but we're not there and it's two years already up. Um, I know Grover had presented 300, which we thought was a little high, but five years. Uh, and <laughs> since we, we might be getting that $1 million and um, if we do include um, advocacy and, and, and supporting public housing as well, why not? So I guess just from like a math standpoint, not that I'm very good at math, but I believe that 250, if you evened it out over five years, would be 50 units coming online a year. So if we're thinking we can't even get to 80 in two years, how are we going to get to 250 in five years realistically, which I think is a, a obviously we need the housing, but I guess I'm just concerned. Again, does that mean that 2029, all of a sudden we're building 250 units um, and the spacing of things, I guess, is something to think about. And obviously we have Vulture Town Road coming online, but that's again years from now. And it's a it would take out a big chunk of those, but well, yeah. so coming online they, in the yeah. immediate. I don't think we should see this as units that are occupied because mm -hmm. that's the only way that you would likely get to 250 in five years is if you had a large chapter 40B development and you counted all of them as affordable, even though only 20 of 20% 20 of them would be because the way that affordable housing goes, it's just, it takes longer, but, but, um, but where you've come to the point where it's happening it's moving forward, it's just that it's not done yet. And I think that you could consider that as counted as you've supported that. So, um, I appreciate what Grover and others are saying. I, I don't think you need to get too hung up on it. Like this is supposed to be a guide. It's supposed to help move you forward, but I don't think we need to get too nitpicky about these things. Um, although to to Nate's point, I appreciate that if 250 is the number that people always hear, it may just sound redundant and not very thoughtful. So, um, and to Allegra, to your point, I think that the, the, why 80 in two years sounds like so much is because two years can go so fast when it's affordable housing. At the same time, if you're only supporting affordable housing developments, if you're primarily supporting affordable housing developments that are 60 units or less, then that's really hard to get to 250 or 300 in five years as well. So. I know, sorry, I was just gonna jump in. I, um, I was like, oh, like, you know, so right now the SHI says we have 1,250 affordable units. And I was like, oh, let's just, you know, 20% of that is 250, ironically, but it's like, well, what percentage would we say, let's update our, you know, if we want to increase our number of affordable units, you know, do we have like some, you know, if we say we want to be like 15% more, 20% more, but it is, so, I mean, that is the right kind of ballpark for me, I guess it's just, you know, it's been, that number has been used a lot. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, to seem stale, right? Even if it's the right number, it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, here's 250 again. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I agree that it's, it could be a stretch. I mean, I think Allegra, there's like this magic wand that happens <laughs> and somehow the units get, get built. No, I don't know, but I agree the in process or permitting, I think would be, could count. Um, I do feel like that, you know, even if we started something now, um, uh, there may not be keys in hand in five years, unfortunately. Right. Like if, right. you know, depending That's on right. how the funding works or what happens. And so, right. you know, I think, um, you know, the town keeps saying, well, let's maybe come up with another site or do something. And it's like, I feel like we could keep moving things along, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we can't say let's have, if they're, you know, totally occupied in five years, that's, that's really aggressive, but yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I think per permitting, I think feels, I I'm Shelly, I'm curious, have other communities come up with a mechanism for this and would, would permitting compare to others or? Um, I, I think it's, I don't know how specific communities get, but um, 
permitting where it's it's definitely moving forward. It, um, seems could be a good measure. I think a good measuring point because you know the the in order to get funding from the most affordable housing needs funding from the state in order to do that you need to have the permitting in place I mean you need to have that needs to be done so you know to Nate's point then it could take two rounds to get the funding from the state that's two years and it could take up nine months or a year to get the permitting depending on how how aggressive the community is so I mean you're easily looking at three years before you even and that's not counting any kind of community process, community engagement as well. So, yeah. So I think that permitting is perhaps the measure that that you might want to use, consider using. Grover. Yeah. So, I. Well, I just want to say the one. I generally agree with the goal, so I'll just say like I don't want to mm -hmm. right the the. Detailed comments isn't a way of saying I don't generally agree with the goal, but I do think the measurement is important because, you know, the goal of the document, right, is to hold the work even as people move on and off. And so having mm -hmm. clear metrics, even if they're in the strategies, just like they're written out, seems important. And a question I have around this, and maybe, maybe it's a solution, is, you know, earlier in the in the meeting, we were talking about the potential of using some funds to um, support reparations for down payment assistance for units that we've already supported already, right? For, and then also, you know, uh, we it's not development to support uh, somebody purchasing a land trust property necessarily unless it's a newly online New, property yeah. right so yeah. like is there a way in this goal to split some units like 50 and then also i can imagine unfortunately the next five years are going to be very interesting in our country and i could imagine that there might be something to happen where suddenly there's a, an urgent ask for um, rental assistance or some other kind of emergency assistance that comes before us. So is there a way to to sort of be realistic about our building goals and also either make as a strategy or include it in some other bucket, some other way that there's part of the chunk of our goals of creating affordable housing, making housing affordable to people through a down payment assistant or an emergency rate like us a cash uh, assistance it's not development right so i'm just acknowledging it's not mm -hmm. development and if we also feel like 250 of permitted units is probably not realistic then yeah and then my second i have just a really concrete question which is do all of the inclusionary units count as this number i'm getting a head nod from i mean would so you one, be would the trust be doing anything to support those to encourage those to make them happen right I or think, did it just happen because no. there's a so then it's a it's just an open question in terms of how we merge the town's goals for affordable units how they're counted and and then i guess you could argue yes because we would advocate for the policy to continue for example So um first reaction, if you if the trust wants to commit to a down payment assistance type program or a buy down program, I actually wouldn't put that in development. I'd make it a fourth goal and do because that seems different enough. And then I would just have a, a fourth goal because I don't really think it fits in the other buckets very well either. So I think that just needs to be a discussion that you have if, if that's something that the trust wants to commit to, or if it feels like that the um, I mean, to do those programs well, then you need to manage them. There needs to be an ad administrative entity, someone that's um, managing the details of the program. I don't know if that's already set up in Amherst or if that's something that you're thinking of how to do. I think it's more that we 
are responsive when other entities are doing it, right? You so mean they, I, you would I help fund, fund it if someone wants to manage the program. Right. I see. Or if just opportunities come up, I mean, the, the money, the thing that we did with the uh, Community Land Trust was they were, man, we just provided kind of the money that was needed because expenses had things had risen so much and it made something mm. possible that would not otherwise have been. And so someone's in a home that wouldn't have otherwise been, we didn't do a lot except a piece of the money. In fact, we didn't mm. really. So I don't know whether it's, if it shouldn't be under development, I would hate to not have that kind of activity as part of our goals somewhere. So I don't care where, if it should not be development, that's fine. Then if it should be another goal, that's fine. But I don't, in my head, I think I was conflating it into development and because mm. I don't want to not do it. So, and if it shouldn't be there, then that's cool, but I don't want to leave it out. And I, or if it's something that's come, that's intermittent, that you're not really managing as a program, but it's something that may come to you intermittently here or there, does it need to be in the goals or is it just... I'm not sure if it needs to be in the goals if you're not actively managing well, well, and funding the program. Managing it and pursuing it are two different things, I think. I think we could be pursuing it, but pursuing situations in which we don't end up having to manage it. Uh, that doesn't seem impossible to me. And so the, only, the thing wrong with not having it in the goals anywhere is that then there's no reason to try to do it. I mean, it feels like, you know, I, I would like a reason to try to work on that. I would like to work on that. Okay. And so I would like to keep it somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, my bad, I guess, that it didn't occur to me that it wasn't part of development. And I kind of get that it isn't, but. Um, well, what if we, we could have just have a home ownership goal? Okay. Yeah. Then that, I mean, that yeah, something like that would be. But and so then it might be development and it might not be development. It could be, however, it could happen in other ways than development. But I don't know. I guess the other thing I wanted to say before was just um, five years is such a short time in in developing anything. When I got on this trust, and I've almost been long here now, hmm. been here long enough now that they're going to kick me off whether I like it or not, and the building that was coming up trying to get started when I came on had people occupying it a few months ago. Uh, that's, you know, so five years is like one of the first hard things that I had to learn when I came on the trust is everything takes so much longer than you wish it yeah. did. And, and, and the other thing about five years and however many whatever the number is the number at least as it described to me was it's it's we need more than that so it's not really mm. a description of what we need it's an aspiration and it's we don't want to make it so small that it we're not trying we don't want to make it so completely big that we it covers mm -hmm. everything we would ever need but we want mm -hmm. it to be a stretch and it mm -hmm. seems like five years is right because whatever you pick as the thing that you're going to measure, they're not going to happen very fast and they're going to happen in lumps. There's no way it's going to be a nice thing like this. It's going to be like this and it's going to be all over the place. So if you don't have five years, you don't even have kind of five years seems with the smallest sample of doing things in this kind of realm that would make sense. Thank you. Erica? So I, I was sort of on the same line with Carol, which I didn't realize development was so narrow in terms of development. Um, I, I actually saw it as including, you know, any unit that we can create to make more affordable for somebody, mm -hmm. I thought that would count. Um, and if it doesn't, if it's really about, you know, the development on Belchertown Road and Southeast Street and which are apartments and ball, uh, but even Ball Lane, I mean, Ball Lane is something that we've supported because they asked us to support. We didn't initiate that. And if we can't count those, that 250, I think, is way over, way over. Um, so as Carol was talking, I've taken it back. I've changed my mind. I think that it should fit under development. 
Okay. All right. Then, sorry, then I'm sorry. fine with 250. Sorry. Okay. All right. Then I'm fine with 250. Okay. I, as we, I as as we talk goal. more and more, as we talk more and more, I, I'm thinking that, 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 that's, that, of course it should fall under development. Yeah. I support the goal. <laughs> Okay, wait. So, so now, so now, if down payment assistance, emergency rental assistance, right? Like it feels slippery. Um, it, would that be included? And I only say this. I know it's important to have goals. I know it's important for us to focus. And I worry that if we create a document that says, "Here's our goals," and our primary goal is to ensure two hundred and fifty units of affordable housing are created over the next five years or in the pipeline to be so that then um, it's almost as if the as if our our strategic plan document theoretically should translate into a budget if we had one like if I was thinking future and then there would be no line item for this need came up in the community and we don't do that Right. Like like this need came up like. Down payment assistance, like so I would just not want it to be the biggest, but a like a, a fund, a slush money um, strategic pot for um, securing affordable housing, be that homeownership or rental. Um, so in is it a, in decided? A is it decided that the trust is going to be doing emergency rent assistance? I guess that's the, this exercise is trying to like narrow yeah. what your, your focus is. And if we're going to keep adding these other things, then I think we need to have a discussion about that. Well, we did that in the emergency of COVID. I mean, right. then, then we decided that given the really dramatically unprecedented and unexpected situation that we were in, we could deal with this emergency by providing some rental assistance so people could stay where they were. And we found ways to have, not have to manage that either. I mean, we, we right. have found somebody else to manage it, but we right. provided the funding. And mm -hmm. so I don't, it's not like we're gonna go try to compete with rats or something or other, but it's like if an emergency comes up in our community again, and we and there's something that we can do about it, it would be, it would be hard not to. Sure. So, so I see that as a little bit different than our goal number one, because that is like, you know, and I, I think I hear what you're saying, Carol, uh, in terms of if it's not somewhere, can we do it or should we do it, et cetera. But I think we're looking at three areas of priorities. And for me, and I love Grover that you're pushing us to be clear because I'm trying to be clear in my mind. I think if it's not long-term, like for example, I think if we, uh, help like with the Amherst uh, Community Land Trust that stays affordable uh, in perpetuity, and you know the the apartments that we have uh, hopefully stays in perpetuity, um, and hopefully Ball Lane will stay you know affordable. But I think you know emergency rental assistance is it was an emergency, and we're we're what we're doing is we're uh, trying to prevent eviction and being unhoused versus creating that apartment as an affordable apartment in perpetuity. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, clarify that too, is that for me, the development is to ensure that whatever space that we're supporting stays affordable. It is actually a creation of an affordable space for a long period of time <laughs> versus just uh, an emergency to, to help somebody through uh, bad times. And I think that you should see this as a living document that it should be revisited every year or two. And if something comes up, it can be modified, but I'm not sure that you put something in that you're not specifically anticipating working on right now. Grover? Yeah, okay. That, cl that, that okay? Uh, yeah, that standard setting is helpful. And also mm -hmm. um, I I agree with you, Erica. And, and in part, I'm saying this because I, I want the document to do its purpose, right? Which is to get us on the same page and mm -hmm. clear on what we're doing together. And mm -hmm. I imagine that that's the kind of thing that may come up. So currently, no, not a priority because we have this longer vision, which is there's enough affordable homes that people aren't going to be 
right? Not able to secure one. And we can change it if there's an emergency because I don't think COVID's the last emergency we're gonna see. Right, unfortunately. So it it seems like the 100% AMI is fine. People generally are, for the most part, five years is okay. The two, I'm still not certain if the 250, if we're okay with the 250, if we want to modify that number. Rover? Um, the 100% is okay for me as a goal, but I would like us to have some different strategies that yeah. clarify AMIs differently. Deeper affordability, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, to me, 100% matches CPA, but I'm not sure that that's, um, <clears throat> you know, a, an AMI that we really have in our bi our zoning bylaw or others. You know, right now it's 80%. And then, you know, I've been saying, you know, if we want to do other things, maybe if we go, we could do 150 or we have some at 60, 100 is just one of those things that it fits the funding, but is it really um, kind of an AMI target? And so... You know, I think it's fine. It's, it's how we how we define what it's in the bylaw a little bit. We reference um, CPA statute um, in the trust bylaw. You did well. We mentioned that right. We the the ability to use CPA funds. We don't actually say like anything else. Mm -hmm. We don't really say what AMI is, but we reference you know using CPA funds. So to me, that it can correspond with that. Um, yeah, you know, I think what I like about this is we had an action plan and I think the trust will be getting more requests for funding. And so not that we're going to say no, but I think it can help the trust be a little bit more judicious in its discussions. And, you know, like right now, for instance, if we weren't getting new CPA money or inclusionary money, the trust might only have a balance of like 100,000, right? Or 130,000. Uh, you know, so we, you know, the what if is like, what if the CPA money doesn't come through or something and the other doesn't, you know, we sit on it for the next year, we have 130,000. All right. What, what, you know, okay. As we start building our pot again, what are, what are the priorities? And I think that this is a nice time to have that. We're having the housing production plan, hopefully getting going soon. There's a little delay there, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's a much greater need and, you know, Shelly said this, right? Like if we say this is a, a one or two year plan, but there's say five year goals or whatever it is, like, let's really focus make something achievable and actionable. And then, you know, it doesn't mean we're not doing other things, but you know, it's like we can reevaluate as we go. And I think that's, that's can be really helpful because I do feel like we could get lost and, you know, just keep putting money here and then there. And then, you know, oh yeah, someone else is looking for some rental subsidy. Oh, next year, you know, a few months later, it's like, oh, there's a, you know, something else. And we're like, oh, sure. And, you know, I think some trust members are like, oh, if we have it, let's spend it. But I'm not, I think we have to be careful with that. Like, I don't want to say now we're going to come up with a voucher program that we're going to support some local voucher program. And, you know, if our goal is to have units, then let's, let's stay that course for a bit and uh, reevaluate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to say one more time, the 250 number. <laughs> should we, should we modify that? Should we, should we? Um... 269. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't, I know. Yeah. I've heard 250 a whole lot. I don't really care yeah, if we leave it or change it. It's just sort of whatever. I, I think we should change it. I mean, to be honest, it's like, okay, we worked really hard with Wayfinders to get a project. They have 45 affordable units, right? 80 total. Uh, Ball Lane had 30. Um, and not even those, depending on how, what AMI you count, you know, there's 10 market rate, right? So then it's like, okay, well, if you actually, put in what we're going to do. I mean, maybe it's 150 over five years in, you know, and, and that's actually like, let's actually push for that. Like maybe we modify the inclusionary zoning to capture more that can count. Maybe we really work on getting two sites, which are each going to net, you know, 40 units. Like, um, you know, if you look at what's underneath that, it's like, okay, can we find sites or get land donated, do fundraising? I mean, I don't want to say let's not reach, but it's like, if we're actually thinking we'll, we're going to get, you know, you know, 50 affordable units of development and we can get three in five years plus some extra, is it 200? I mean, you know, and we map it out in a way that makes sense as opposed to just saying like, oh goodness, we have to have five comprehensive permits, one a year for the next five years. That just seems really unrealistic. Or maybe the trust is the one that actually gets the 250 unit, the 250 units done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we wouldn't mind if we exceeded a goal. So that's not really going to be a problem ever. So but it's I, like I, making a checklist of things you've already done just so you can uh, check no. it out. Right. That's on the list so I can check it off. Yeah. I, no, but I, 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 mean, I just think like, I don't want, right. I don't, you know, like if we did say 150 or 180 and you're like, wow, that's actually something we're going to really, you know, it's like, it, to me, it seems like that's more kind of reasonable and feasible. And maybe we'd actually push for it instead of like, getting a little exasperated and being like, oh gosh, 250, but like, you know, I don't know. So I personally think that under 200 is, is too little for your community. That's my 200. personal opinion. Yeah. Maybe I 200. Go Let's go for 200. Sure. 200 going once. <laughs> Does anyone um, have an, an issue with it being 200? Less than 250? Of course, you can always go over, but I, I to me, under 200 is just too low for you. That's the nudge we needed. We just needed someone to say something. Grover, I know that, I think that you proposed 300. So how, how are you feeling about the drop to 200? I mean, I want us to come out throwing elbows and like get to 300. And also we meet once a month. We're like, we're like, I feel like we're starting to like, we're like a crew team that moved from the, you know, gym rower onto the water. And, um, <laughs> and so I don't want to be, how do I say unnecessarily, but you know, the one holding the light forward. Uh, if, yeah, because I do agree with Nate that the numbers are the numbers. And also, I want more. But also, do mm -hmm. we have the energy to get, you know, my my land acquisition goals were higher than the, like, proposed strategies here. Mm -hmm. And that would require a lot of what's not seen in this meetings, which is, like, networking and asks and relationship building and mm -hmm. right research and and all these kinds of things and now we have greg so so like some of some more research and things like that like things happen but also so yeah i would like more and it sounds like everyone else is pressing lower so i would seed that and hope we i will i was looking forward to the party where we celebrate that we exceeded 200 units mm -hmm. is what i was imagining you can still have that party. You can still, you can still like exceed 200 units. It'd be awesome if you got to that. Okay. So does it, we'll move it down to two. We'll keep it as it is, except move um, from 250 to 200 with hopes that you actually hit 250. <laughs> okay. We're going to hit 300. I mean, 300. That's what I meant. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. So wait, what if we? What is it going to be now? Two hundred or three hundred? Two hundred. Two hundred. Okay. Thank you. Two hundred on paper and three hundred in our hearts. <laughs> All right. Yay, Grover. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Can we move on to? The, are people comfortable with that? We can move on to the second one. Okay. So the second one is funding. All about funding and setting a a. a fairly ambitious of securing $4 million over the next five years to support the work of the trust. Now, has this million dollars been committed for sure or is it still a possibility? The million dollars, the is that for sure yet, or is it still I mean, a, only a possibility? I mean, nothing's for sure until we have like money in, money the, bank in the bank account. Yeah. But I, but I, the the developments moving forward. Um, so, <laughs> like, we're, we're it, yes, it's 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 we, we should plan on it. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I guess. Sorry, Chad. What was the question? I was I was um, stuck on the action steps for the first goal. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to search all the municipally owned properties oh. and I was just thinking, sorry, just I'll backtrack. Maybe it's not municipal owned, uh, municipally owned. I feel like the town doesn't own many great sites, to be honest. 
but maybe it's, you know, a choir or something, just two properties could be municipal or private. I feel like a better opportunity is actually, you know, that, um, we had done kind of a broad brush, look at municipal properties a few times in the last five years. And, you know, once the town owns it, it's like the disposition process and all this stuff is just pretty cumbersome. And honestly, it's like, we don't, we don't own like a nice 20 acre flat field somewhere. It's like we own, you know. I, th I think we're to come back at strategies actually. Yeah. I know, I know. I'm just, yeah, yeah, I was just, yeah. you know, sorry. It's, I was good just... to, it's good to hear though that, that that the small group can take that into consideration when they're considering strategies. But when you ask about funding, sorry, because I was looking at for, for mapping some stuff. Did you ask about the inclu the inclusionary payment or what? Yes, the next yes. I just was wondering how, because getting back to kind of Grover's pushing us to be, um, explicit thoughtful and explicit about how we're going to measure this like will we count that million towards this or is it because it's already far enough along then we're saying we're not going to count that with this four million that's what i was going to get in at oh right 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 uh interesting greg how did you answer that i'm curious um well i mean i i answered that nothing is official <laughs> until it's in the bank but uh right. i think we're going to receive those funds um you know i mean that that development's underway i suppose they could stop building midway and not get a certificate you know i mean the developer is unlikely to go under you know it's it's an experienced developer other than yeah, that i can't imagine way, staring, or we don't get those funds yeah actually i mean right it's interesting the way it is the funds are tied to is it the is it a building permit or occupancy permit a certificate of occupancy i believe yeah so um so we should get them for not, but, but not for a while. But so right. that means we can count it in our 4 million. <laughs> sure. I don't know. I, mean, I guess you could, you know, I, we, this won't be more formally kind of completed until likely the summer, which would be the new fiscal year. Um, so it's, it's up to you of what, whether you want to start say that that's already, you've already advocated for that, you've already got the commitment, and then it's 4 million beyond that. Or um, I guess if at, at the end of five years, you don't have your 4 million, you could go back and count. <laughs> I think psychologically, it's probably cleaner to say that our, rather like, you know, the choices seem like we could not count that and trim the goal. I think it's actually better to count it and keep the goal at 4 million. I agree. You know, I think, you know, put, put a couple of snaps in our punch card on the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, 2019 to now, uh, the only fundings we've been able to get is from the CPA and, you know, we, we've been pretty, they've been pretty generous with us, but we never got as much as we've asked for. Um, and so this is the first time we've actually gotten something this high up. Um, you know, 1.2 million is a lot of money. And unless the transfer fee comes, uh, we're going to start having to throw some uh, funding parties. <laughs> um, but the, 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 where I always have a hard time with us doing fundraising is, is that there are lots of organizations who are doing excellent work that I do not want to be competing against. And I don't even know how much we can fundraise. So, you know, we're looking at either, you know, wonderful donors out there or us somehow twisting UMass and, and the other colleges arms or uh, transfer fees uh, or more people like, uh, you know, Barry Roberts. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure where we're going to get the four million from. Um, Grover, did you want to comment? Well, I was just going to say, I think your list that you just read out, though, Eric, has such an amazing list like like i agree with you i don't think that fundraising like a backyard party when that money like you can only go to the same well so many times in terms of like my kids parent friends you know my kids friends parents right. so um i i i feel good about this number i feel agnostic as to i i think Greg's point about it'll sort of like get us feeling the fire is good. It will feel so. So again, I say keep it and count the million and surpass it because I'm hopeful that 
if in lieu payments are effective at creating more homes, that we'll see more of them. And also, it's long past every community in the United States, in my opinion, have a transfer tax on short-term rentals, right, including ours. So, um, yeah, I think we can do it. Other thoughts on this goal? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say it might go hand in hand with a few other things. So if we have unit creation or other things, um, and we have this payment in lieu option for inclusionary zoning, maybe it helps to trust, you know, if there's another project that maybe is providing two units somewhere, you know, what's the balancing act or whatever it is. Do we allow a payment because it can actually, we can leverage that to get more affordable units. And so, you know, I think in that respect, it can help, um, you know, further on the agenda, we, uh, we're proposing a slight change to the inclusionary zoning to allow, a, you know, a, a greater payment or a lesser payment, depending on units, um, other things. But, you know, I think both the trust and planning board felt it was hard to get the developer to pay more than what the bylaw stated. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think it could be reasonable to say, yeah, how do we, how do we navigate that in the future is, you know, you know, it, could we take another payment in lieu to get to a goal? Because then that means we can fund a development of 50 units somewhere or some home home ownership units somewhere or do something that, you know, we're leveraging it. And yeah, I think that can help the trust be a little more maybe um, kind of active. Um, I, I like 4 million. I have no idea where it's going to come from, but I, I guess to me, it is clear that the strategies are going to be about things like things that are not going out and actually directly getting the money. It's going to be like supporting the transfer fee, coming up with some kind of rental fee that we might decide to support. It's going to be supporting something or other that's a mechanism that is not us going out and saying, give me some money, please, because that's not going to work. And the only thing that I worry a little bit about is it's four and a half years from now, and here's a development that's about to go in, and they're offering us in lieu. And if we take the in lieu, we'll get over our $4 million. But, oh, maybe we want these units, because if we take the units, we'll get up to our some other goal. I just, I hope we don't get in a situation where we're, where we're worrying about that. But I think we are better than that, and it'll be okay. <laughs> I think you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no consequence for us, like, or shiny cake. It's good. There's no shiny cake at the end in terms of government accountability, but like, it's merely satisfaction, I think, and our own commitment to what the work that we're doing that we yeah. need to go Right. And so, whether somewhat we decide it's strategically beneficial to keep the units in the building or take the money they're both a win because ultimately our our mission is our mission yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely so are folks comfortable to keep this as it is and to move on to the third goal um actually i want to um re-raise the the suggestion that i made in our, in our small group just to air it again um where, where I suggested, or, or somebody suggested, and I agreed that um, acquiring land is as a way of accumulating resources, which is what I think this goal is about. And and you argued, so you argue that that land is a development strategy, um, but you know I see, I see that as a means to get to development, but so is money getting to development. So if we if we if we get a million dollars to build 10 units, is that 10 units or is that a million dollars? It's it's you know it's what's so anyway, I I I think that um you know if, if we were to acquire four million dollars in assets or five million dollars in assets, which could be land assets, um you know that's that's the way I see this goal, but I I understand um, your possession as well. But I just wanted to raise that so that people knew that we had that discussion. So 
the part of the reason why I was pushing back on putting it in funding is because I think it also goes under development and it could be where the strategies are the same for two different goals for the, you'd have the same strategy for two different goals. And to me, that's confusing. So that's why I was pushing, advocating to separate those and have funding just be cash. Um, right, but, because... but, but so then, so then that is that $4 million not go to the 250 or to the 200 homes? I mean, that's, that's what I mean. I, I don't, are we saying 200 homes and four million dollars to do rental assistance and and um, homeless shelter and, and other things? You know, I, I, that's that's okay. why it's confusing I, to me. I, what, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because basically it's it's number two to help support number one. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to jump in and say, even if that's true, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, sorry, Greg, I saw your hand raised. But the um, I think it's nice to have that, though, because, uh, you know, unit creation or development is one thing. And then there's some some steps underneath that. And then there's fundraising or funding. And I think it's really important for the trust, as Carol said, you know, are there other mechanisms or methods to to develop funding? And maybe it's, you know, we try to come up with different ways to have continuous funding or some rev some revenue streams and whether or not it supports the 250 or not it's really, I think that's a really important thing for the trust to come up with and so you know CPA has been nice maybe you know the like that percentage allocation is great but you know what if there's a few other things that the trust advocates for and pushes for and it in you know and it just, and, you know and it it can be used for whatever but I think it's just nice to have that as uh you know a goal because it's I think it'll help the trust and everyone realize that that's it's you know that's that's where it is right we want to get there um and funding can help with a lot of different things maybe it even it's helps tangible. with goal number three but it's just i think it's a it's nice to have kind of that impetus to keep us mm -hmm. um kind of you know imagining what could be possible and under development with the it's actually now 200 200 units um it's the trust wouldn't necessarily have to fund all of those. It, there could be a more traditional 40B development that's just 20% affordable that the trust decides to help advocate for because it does have some affordable units in it. And so that would be, you'd still be moving towards creating more affordable housing, even though we could all argue that 80% is not affordable, you know, all that. But um, there could be other efforts where the trust is actively supporting it, but not putting cash in the deal as well. So, but I, I definitely see what you're saying, Rob, that it, it gets a little squishy when you really think of it that way. And I, I kind of had been thinking of it as goal two, the, the funding goal does support goal one. Right. I, I, I don't think they're separate. I mean, I like no. I think they should be broken out in our document here, but I also. But but Rob, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's envisioned that all those funds would not go to development. Probably the mo majority of them would. What? But I think. Fun, you know, I think funding is such a critical resource for that, that it's worth elevating to a goal level rather than just housing it under development. Um, just because, the you know, the. the the work that it takes to seek those those financial resources it's it's worth elevating it in my mind but but yeah they would i think support stuff under the development line not necessarily yeah. exclusively but significantly except you know rob was talking about do you just um value land as a not just have funding as cash but also as the asset of land I still support, I think it should be cash, but that's, that's, but I'm only, I'm just the, I'm just helping. And if the rest of you, it's, it's your, your plan, how you want to think about it. I mean, it just makes me wonder if the, the like three tied goals is, a, it's like a deeply ingrained number and also it's clean and but it makes me wonder about the hierarchy of our information in that it seems to me like I was reading this document 
And so thank you for asking the question, Rob, that the document is actually pointing to the first development goal as the primary goal of the trust over the next five years. And then the other things support that goal and have other effects, right? Like any education we do is going to have other effects outside of what the work the trust does or anything we do in five years. And also it is going to point us towards that goal because hopefully it reduces resistance, reduces time lag, right? Those things. So just naming that, I'm not saying we have to rewrite the goals. I think whoever's going to read this document will probably read it similarly. And at the party, we can be like, remember when Rob said that? Oh my gosh, we have so many assets because we have land and we met our financial goal. <laughs> going to be great. <laughs> Just for me, the way that my brain works is that we want, we want a land donation from UMass Amherst to build units. So I'm thinking of that as units instead of cash, where to me, I'd see it as cash if you want to sell it to make money to then invest. So that that's just how my brain works that I'm thinking we want the land for units. How many units can we get on the land? That That's maybe just how my brain works. brain is working but if we're having this conversation are we saying because i'm seeing land under a strategy for development but would funding also then be a development strategy so uh, I, actually just you making that comment is reminding me that we're getting too deep into strategies right now and and we really need to be focused back on goals so i'm, I'm so sorry so why don't we continue mulling this over in the small group and with what we develop as strategies? And what if if we're okay with number two at this point, moving on to three, just because we are coming up at nine o'clock just to be sensitive to people's time. Is that okay, Rob? Okay, okay, great. So the, the third one is looking at education and, and public engagement, knowing that even though Amherst has come a long way, particularly compared to a lot of our communities in Massachusetts, that there's always more work to be done around engaging the community and building broader support for affordable housing. So this one says, develop a minimum of four events a year to educate the community about local housing needs and build support for more affordable housing. So I'm working in a couple other communities. One of them they were concerned about the word event because of what that suggested to them about kind of time commitment of an event. And they wanted one of these events to be able to be perhaps a social media campaign around a certain development or effort or something where it's not really an event. Um, so I wanted to put that out there that as I'm working with this other community, I think we're using, um, outreach efforts or something like that, some different phrasing. So it's not just event specific. So I just want to put that on the table and, and have a conversation of how, how this goal feels to you because, you know, you're a volunteer board, you have Greg, but you're a volunteer board. Four events every year can be, can be a lot. That's one per quarter. So that that's, it can feel pretty heavy, pretty fast. I well, that's my it. concern. I can't imagine doing four events in a year. It takes us right. for, it takes us, I just don't think that's going to, I think it's unrealistic. And, um, and maybe mm -hmm. it would be, maybe if you change event to something different, then four would be okay. But if you leave events, four is too many, two yeah. might be more possible, more, more reasonable to me. But I think maybe I like the idea of expanding what it is that can be done because the point is community engagement in whatever way that you think up to do it. Mm -hmm. I think I interrupted Grover. But your comment was so great. I feel <laughs> glad about that. I um I also agree that for in person events seems overly ambitious. Mm -hmm. Although we do have like, you know, we have been amplifying the East Street event that happened a couple months ago. You know, there we I think if we were to slice it different ways, we would get there. But um, 
I think just changing that one word to to whatever you suggest because it's 9 p.m. And but like you know a word that means a kind of engagement and engagement outside of our regular meetings with the community, be that social media, um, a communications campaign, thing. hosting an event, co-hosting an event, public conversation. We did the listening mm-hmm. sessions more than a mm-hmm. year ago. So I but it sounds good to me if that gets massaged. Not- so if it's something like um, outreach efforts, does that sound like it could work or do you have a different idea? Well, uh, I was going to jump in. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't know how much if it's semantics or not, but I was thinking like three, like one a quarter. And I like the idea that it's something that is not normal trust business. And so, for instance, I don't, you know, we're, we're you know, when we have a comprehensive permit, we set up a web page, we do a lot of things. But to me, that's, uh, part of the permit process. And I wouldn't want to say that's an outreach effort. So, you know, as long as it's like something that is a little, um, you know, beyond what would be kind of perfunctory business of the trust or the town. And I don't want to make it sound like what we're doing isn't important, but you know, it's like, I did like those listening sessions or like, what if every year we just did like, you know, we reached out to the rental registration, all the landlords and had, um, you know, a meeting again about renting to voucher holders or something, or we, you know, we come up with an idea that like, okay, three times a year, we're going to have, this and we can you know it might be a slow start but hopefully we can get the idea of rolling that okay like these three months typically it's like whatever it is like april september november whatever it is like we're going to be doing something and we really start programming and people expect it and i mean that's what the when i read that that's kind of what, what i was envisioning like okay yeah let's have some of these pieces that really pull people in like what if it's you know having some you know pulling in banks and having like home ownership stuff like we talk about all about equity and you know we have different you know vendors or people come and so yeah i, I don't know i mean it can be it could be in person it could be multimedia but i'm just you know i was thinking it was something like that uh and i think three is reasonable for still i agree four seems like a lot but so i would just suggest that this whatever is done under this that it really is helping to reinforce the goals of development of units so some of what you're bringing up, Nate, I think is important, but I'm, I think it could get away from this focus of units, developing units. Um, but the, it doesn't have to be just, so you, this trust is oftentimes done in annual forum, like a community forum. And so that could be like a, an event event, a traditional, more kind of traditional event. And maybe you continue that. And maybe that's one of these outreach efforts but then it could be that another is, I mean, in my opinion, under funding, you really need to figure out a way to build your relationship with the CPC and get more CPA funds. That's just my personal opinion. So another could be just having this, uh, some sort of joint, you know, having a joint meeting with them, but really making sure that you're building the relationship with the CPC, that you're articulating, making sure that they are um, aware of housing needs in the community and that you're updating them. And so, we don't have to just do a traditional kind of event, but it could be these other kinds of efforts. And then you do so many other things in the community where you're bringing awareness to housing, but I think you just want to make sure that you don't get too far away from that this goal helps to reinforce the other goals. You know, and to that, I, I think, you know, the, the, emphasizing these could look a lot of ways, right? You know, but um, you know, an example that comes to mind is, I could imagine sometime in the next five year time horizon, there being a land use decision at ZBA or at um, uh, at the planning board um, that needed a push, right? An organized effort that goes beyond just this meeting, you know, this monthly meeting um, to enroll public participation in that conversation. I, I think that would absolutely qualify as far as what we're talking about here, you know, presuming there was, you know, there was some infrastructure around it that, you know, put some meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, if there were another home ownership program partnering in, you know, mar- marketing and outreach in some way and the affirmative marketing plan, that's maybe outside of our lane a bit, but, you know, but I, I think there's lots of different um, sort of uh, community engagement strategies that absolutely could attach to our other goals, you know? Um, and I think to me, one of the, 
measuring points is is outputs, you know, or intended outputs. Um, not necessarily that we hold ourselves to some certain standard, but that the engagement is intended to have an output that is nameable, you know. Um, maybe let's pause there, but yeah. yeah, I think I and I think three of those, you know, I the for, in, at the staff level, I'm thinking about it in terms of what I have, like a project timeline and, you know, task list and things to delegate to different people and a list of calls to make, you know, would, would it rise yeah. to that level? Um, that's kind of how I would filter it. I mean, you could point that at a lot of different things. Could be a public forum, could be an, an advocacy effort, um, could be a trip to Boston, you know, come budget time, go holler about the transfer fee. Well, and Greg, you could potentially have one or two members of the trust be on a small committee, a planning yep. committee to kind of plan out the year on a yearly basis, just as you're mapping it out. Uh, that could just be how someone on the trust kind of really puts, really uh, engages. And I think, you know, in this, you know, yeah, I agree for sure. That'd be a great idea. It'd be a fantastic idea. And I think, just thinking about our role as a catalytic component within town government for, you know, affordable homes, you know, I, I, that's a big part of why this is important. I think, you know, is that, you know, some of these might not be super hugely broadly public. Some of them might be more narrow and intentional and sustained, you know, like, you know, um, and, you know, I, yeah. So I mean, without getting too deep into the weeds, I, I think, um, you know, there's lots of different ways this could look, but I, and I think they're fairly nameable. I think we could come up with a, a pretty reasonable set of criteria, and and then on an annual basis, ask the group to say, "Hey, what what should we focus on this year?" and then make some proposals. And mm -hmm. and if you have, I mean, you're having the updating the housing production plan coming up, so you have a great something yes, for really sure. immediate coming up that you can build some things around. So what if we say got, develop, oh, sorry, go ahead. You can finish what you're saying and then. I was just gonna propose um, the develop a minimum of three outreach outreach efforts a year. Um, I guess that's okay. Listening to what Greg just said, it more seems important to me to develop uh, a committee that plans a year's events or something or other than just develop a bunch of events. I, I don't, each one of them seems to me to take a lot of effort, more effort than anyone ever thinks of when they say you could do da -da 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 -da, because it takes a lot of effort to make da -da 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 happen that nobody thinks of. <laughs> and, and so if we just say we're gonna develop three or however many, I, I don't know how to write it, but I would like to say something that said, we're gonna do this in a concerted way and we will have a, each year or something, we'll have a, here's what we're gonna do this year and here's who's gonna tell us each what we have to do about it or something than just a number. So, but I'll accept the number. But the other thing I wanted to say actually is uh, it's 9.03. And so yeah. I wanna make sure that we have, that people can stay till I don't know, 9.10 or something so we can finish this conversation and then give me two minutes to, because most of the other things on the agenda are getting ready for next time. And so that won't take very long, but is it okay with everybody to stay another 10 or 15 minutes? Just give me some thumbs if that's acceptable. Um, can you, okay. All right, go ahead. Oh, so I would only respond to you, Carol, simply saying that we will get more into those details in the strategies and we could even have some, more general language just associated with this plan of kind of guidance to how to do the planning every year for this particular goal. Yeah. So it won't, they won't just stay at the goal. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll dig deeper. All right. I guess that's okay. Okay. Grover. I would, I would just request that the goal as stated have integrated educate the community about local housing needs and build support for more affordable housing. Some phrase about working towards 
the something about working towards the goals because I could imagine a way in which the trust felt like we had to do three as was named like one off events and in organizing hyper focusing those towards the goals and then and then making the events match that is always going to be more effective and less exhausting and so just some phrase saying orienting four events a year to educate the community help achieve our goal, our main goals and then the third clause build support for more affordable housing something like that that okay. would be my request and then I, we're we you know starting to go down the strategy land and it's late but um, I also wouldn't I personally wouldn't want us to be too prescriptive beyond create a working group um, because to say at the beginning of the year that we have to map it out goes to what I was worried about, which is what I think is not super strategic strategy. Because if a development is proposed that's contentious, then a lot of our energy is going to go there and we're going to decide that we're going to do an event about it or we're going to write an op-ed and have a communications plan, right? Like some portion of it is responsive. So we, so there's a balance of pre-planned, but also some that is like, actually, we need to go to the legislature and get really loud about this. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, yeah, not going to be decided in a January meeting. Do you think that by keeping the language of a minimum of, that that kind of helps with that? That we want to make sure that we're doing a minimum of this, but that doesn't preclude you from doing, responding to other things that come along? Yeah, but I also don't think that in January we should say we're going to do these three events, not no what the context we're dealing with is. I think it's like we should sort of check it right as mm -hmm. the subcommittee. Okay, we can think that out a little bit more. Okay, so we'll consider, um, I guess just because it is after nine, why don't we, um, what is it the small, I'll propose some language responding to you to the small group. And then when they're comfortable with it, then we'll send it back to the full group. And then I think, you know, don't reply all, but just reply to Greg with your feedback on that. And then if we can just have your thoughts tightened up before the, before the next small group meeting, which is probably a week or so away so that we can start digging into strategies, that would be helpful. But Nate, do you have something to, to add to this? No, I guess in terms of like how this gets done, I mean, I was thinking if we have three goals, you know, we have three subcommittees of the trust, right? Or we, the idea would be that this becomes something people can invest themselves in and maybe they pick something, right? And it, but the idea to me, the idea would be, and I thought the hope would, was this is that, you know, a, after this process, you know, maybe there is one, two, three, whatever, you know, subcommittees that are actually working toward, you know, um, individual goals or strategies, right? And so, yeah, so maybe there is something, there is a group that is working toward the uh, outreach efforts. Maybe there's some that's working on researching funding mechanisms, but that, that's what, that's my vision, right? Like, I don't, I'm, you know, I think Greg uh, might like all the um, the lists and, and everything, um, you know, and sure, and, and running with stuff. I'm, I don't want to put so much on his plate, though, that he gets overwhelmed, right, or myself. But right. that's what I was hoping that through this process, the trust is feeling kind of empowered and members are really interested and say, yeah, I'm going to pick this up whether it's an ad hoc group or a formal subcommittee or whatever, we're going to run with it. And so that's what I'm hoping we get out of this, right? That there is some interest uh, and, you know, staff can always help, but you know, that members are like, yeah, I want to pick this up too and, and really, really move forward. So I don't, you know, how that gets done in the future. Sure. But that's the way I, that's the way I've been envisioning it. The outcome of this is we have these, this nice document we can send around to planning boards, CRC, others. And then there is, you know, whether we bring in outside people to help us, but we're really, you know, then taking active steps to, to make it happen. Yes. Yep. So my hope is that once we have the strategies outlined, then you'll be able to start thinking which strategies are going to, are you going to start with and then create tasks underneath that, that you can be delegating to people to actually move forward on specific strategies. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, as I said, if it's okay with the small group that I will work on, 
modifying these based on our conversation, adding the phrase as Grover is suggesting, I'll get it to the small group, ask for your feedback. And then Greg or Eric or Carol, whoever will send it to the, the full board for your okay or your reaction um, to get everybody on the same page with the goals, the three goals before the small group meets again to start digging into strategies. Does that work? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thanks. Such a great conversation. Thanks so much for being very engaged. It's really nice. I'm going to sign off and then let you finish up your meeting and I'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, Thanks. for Thank your you. help. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Shelley. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, the Historical Commission just had a new preservation plan update and then they have some, you know, goals they're trying to work through. Sheila. And it's a, it's a similar process. But I think having Shelly is so helpful because I think the commission right now, the circle commission is getting stuck on what do we do? And so to focus in on then strategies and action steps is is really important. And so I feel like I want to take this back to the historical commission because I feel like, you know, we've had one and two year goals and we just met uh, last week. But it's like, OK, how do we actually make it feasible and actionable? And I think that's. You know, this is it's a really it's a really difficult process to kind of distill something that's really broad and a vision down to this. And I, I really appreciate that Shelley and you guys are working through this. I think it's really great that members of the trust are doing this. Thanks, Nate. Um, so I think that I have just these couple of other things on here. One being we we talked at the last meeting about our our route to UMass is through Paul and Dave. And so we wanted to put together a set of whatever the questions are that seem most important to us to ask them to take to their meetings. So I would like to actually not try to do that right now, but ask people to please, whatever you think might be important questions that you'd like to ask, get them all to Greg between now and, I don't know, between now and a week or so before our next meeting so he can compile them or look at them or put them together in some way so that we can have a discussion and come up with what we what we collectively think we want to say to them. We'll do that next time, but it would be good to have some place to start from, which would be each of us thinking up whatever questions we've got and letting let Greg sort of put it together for us to look at. Um, so is that clear? Any questions about that or anything? Okay, that's great. So I just want to jump in and just uh, quickly, it can be anything like, you know, data requests, like, you know, how many, you know, students on or off campus projections, you know, uh, things they have ideas for housing. It could be like, you know, the, one of the strategies is land donation or disposition. And so I think for now it could be anything that, you know, we think could be funneled through the town manager's office and discussions. And then, and then, you know, we can refine it, but um, yeah, I mean, it could be, to me, tangential to housing or the trust sometimes, if it could then impact, you know, later on. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, how many housing units are you going to create? Let's think, you know, what else it, could it be? Like, you know, do they have a plan what? for faculty moving forward, housing, but whatever, you know, so I think it could be pretty creative right now just to. Uh, and I'll, I'll send some prompts out in an email. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we've had lots of many kinds of questions to ask them, and I bet you will come up with a good bunch to, to get to Greg and to be able to look at together next time. Um, and the other thing is we asked Nate for, and it's, a and it's the last thing in the packet that we got, is uh, language for inclusionary zoning. This is the short version. This is just what do we want to do that we hope we can get through quickly that will make it possible for somebody to decide to give us a different amount of money than the exact amount that's written in there now that the that the planning board didn't feel they could they could um, amend or go above and so look at look at Nate's draft. We'd like to be able to say to whoever we need to say it to, we would like to see this happen. It would be very helpful. There's lots of other things we might want to do the enclosing our zoning, but but I think that it makes sense. Nate thinks it makes sense. Correct me if I'm wrong, but to do this this one thing by itself so that hopefully we can get it through quickly and not have to wait for the whole everything everyone ever is going to have to say about inclusionary zoning before we get this done. So I is the only thing to say about that is just 
we'll, we'll look at it really next time, unless everybody's already looked at it and wants to say yes in the next 10 seconds, so. Yes. I thought this, mean, this means you like it so much we don't have to talk about it or we're gonna talk about it next time. I think Rob had his fingers down. And he had his fingers down, all right. So okay. Well, yes. we... I, no, I, I don't like it, so I, I think we should talk about it next. Okay, well, we'll talk. Well, then we'll we'll talk about it next time, I guess. So talk about it next time. Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay, next time. great. And then, so, yeah. So quickly, I think next time too, if we talk about it, we can talk about would the trust, you know, be the sponsor of this? So we we move it along, as opposed to recommending I, it to the planning board. It could be that the trust says this is, you know, we, the trust sponsors it, and it goes to council. Um, you know, if we can if we can refine the language and get it to where we like it. Uh, you know, I can have the building commissioner and planning director review it again, and then we can, you know, just yeah. So end it. right, I think that we were kind of looking to you. I think, as Nate, you were trying to figure out where it should it come from, and so okay. we will. But let's talk about it next time. I yes. would like to not talk about it now, but everybody look at it again. We'll get a chance. We'll have it on our uh, next agenda. Um, and I, unless somebody, we have one attendee still who is Grace, who um, I, I assume probably doesn't have anything to say, but if you raise your hand and you want to say something quick as a public comment, please raise your hand. Otherwise, Erica wants to say something. I just want to say happy birthday to Carol. She actually spent her birthday evening nah. co-facilitating this meeting. So thank you very, very much, Carol, for <laughs> happy uh, birthday, Carol. being here. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, happy birthday, Carol. Any, thank you. Rob or anyone, if you have comments on that, the inclusion of zoning, send it to us, Rob. If you want to, we could call, call you know, we have, we'd have a call, phone call or something, but just yeah. It'd be nice to have, you know, any other ideas too for next meeting. We could have that in a different version just to discuss. Okay. So if anybody else, Rob may do that. If anybody else has anything, we'll send that right to Nate, I think, because he's the one who's drafted it. And so he can, is that okay with you, Nate? Oh, yeah, we we'll yeah. send those things to you. So if mm -hmm. anybody has anything that they want to put into the conversation for Nate to look at, and we'll look at it all next time. And I think that's it. Unless anybody has anything they need to say, our meeting is adjourned at 9.17 p.m. Thank you all very much, and have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good work, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Good night.